Hey everyone, Joe Waxman here. And in this video, I want to look at the chart of Carl Jung, famous psychoanalyst, psychologist. Show my screen. He was a contemporary of Sigmund Freud and uh, one of his, I guess, um, early successors, somebody who uh, Jung wanted to carry on his work. Later, they, they fell into disagreement. But uh, yeah, let's, let's go over it. Start with the basics first. Um, Sun and Leo conjunct the descendant and actually very similar to, uh, to Freud, but although Freud's was not in uh, Leo, it's in Taurus. But so Sun's in very good dignity here and it, and it shows that <clears throat> like Freud, he is taking an active interest in relationships and in, in being a sort of counselor to others, uh, having his son in the house of relationships very close to the descendant. Also, Uranus is, is pretty close to the sun, uh, 11 degrees. And that also is very similar to uh, Freud interestingly enough, and shows a very active mind, very original, uh, lots of ideas, independent, uh, brilliant genius, kind of Uranian. All the Ur Uranian qualities are are influencing his son. Um, he's a very independent and um, individualistic kind of people. Right, and so He's bringing that into the seventh house. Uh, his moon's in Taurus, and it's exalted here in Taurus. And so it's quite a co good combination, generally speaking, sun and Leo, moon and Taurus. However, if you look a bit closer, we can tell that there's some things going on with the moon. Uh, number one, we see a square to Uranus. And squares to the moon are, are not very good usually because uh, the moon is such a sensitive part of, of our chart, of our astrology. It represents our inner mind, our emotions, our emotional satisfaction. And moon can easily be disturbed. It also represents our mother and our early childhood upbringing. Um, uh, a square to Uranus can show some shocks, some some instability, some trauma, um, you know, both to his own inner mind as well as his, his mother and his own happiness and childhood upbringing. There's also a conjunction to Pluto, which can be very disturbing. Pluto can also represent trauma, uh, psychological factors, abuse, um power control issues um things of that nature moons essentially in the fourth uh third quadrant but for approaching the fourth house cusp so third fourth um third and fourth significations um and then we're getting another square this but this to, to pluto with, with saturn and Saturn is the ascendant lord. So, um, yeah, that's bringing in that um, hard, aspect, hard aspects between Saturn and, and Pluto are very, very serious uh, because these are both heavy, malefic planets. You know, you know, these it's like uh, two heavyweights going head to head. Um, especially with the square, you know, a conjunction is equally as difficult. Um, but this shows like a very intense uh, quality that he has. So something is very serious and heavy minded. Um, Pluto, which represents the, the psychological aspect is becoming very um, Saturnian, so scientific. Um, crystallized, hard, deep, um, and science, uh, and then his ascendant lord, 
is becoming somewhat um, psychological. It's bringing in plutonic elements, um, issues of power and control and abuse um, are affecting him. So, and Saturn also being connecting to Pluto is still influencing the moon, the mind. Uh, Neptune is, is kind of far, like 12 degrees away from the moon, but still then you're bringing in Neptunian elements, which could be illusion, delusion, fantasy, as well as creativity and uh, general imagination and expansiveness. The significance of this is that his childhood, especially his mother, was um, his mother did have mental health issues. Um, at night, she would uh, she complained of you know spirits or I don't know what. I mean, she had she had issues. It didn't go into too much detail in the Wikipedia. Um, but there were mental health issues and she went away for the, um, for a period of time during his youth uh, for unspecified health issues, probably related to her mind. Um, and you can see that here. And, and, you know, it being in Taurus actually does not um, negate the mental health aspects, the, the difficult aspects between Uranus, Pluto and Neptune. And even Saturn's getting into it. Um, and what I would say about that is that even though the moon, moon's exalted, so probably his mother was very loving, very caring, very, you know, kind and nourishing, but as well as having these mental health issues. Right. And then later, I'm kind of jumping ahead, uh, later at some point in his life, like he was very stable, but then he did have periods of psychosis at least once. Um, and he um, considered that as valuable experience for his psychological analysis. So he started out, um, his father was a, a preacher, I believe, a religious, uh, something like that. And he, he initially wanted to go into that. Then he decided to go into um, psychology. And we can see an active sixth house, house which is, you know, the mental, mental health. Um, sorry, not mental health, just health in general. But it, it does have the eighth lord of Mercury. Mercury's ruling the fifth and the eighth. So fifth house would be general education. You know, also children, entertainment, fun games, um, things of that nature, but general entertainment, general spirituality, as well as Venus, which is ruling the fourth house cusp and the ninth house cusp. So higher education, general education, and um, eighth house which would be, you know, the psychological influence, as well as Pluto to the moon is, is also adding a lot of psychological influence and Pluto square, the ascendant Lord Saturn. Um, so a lot of psych psychological influences going into the, the sixth house of health. So we can see, you know, mental health already being a major, major um, theme in his life. Um, and then Moon and Venus are are have a mutual reception here, so fourth and sixth house are, are exchanging um, energies houses. So from an early age, then he was already going into that, and he did you know decide on his psychological interests from a, a pretty young age. Um, and it's also showing his what makes him happy because. Moon is our emotional contentment, contentment, but so is um, Fourth Lord. So Moon and Venus are, you know, very much exchanging places. Um, 
because moon has moon represents what fourth house represents and it's in the sign of venus and venus is in the sign of moon so i mean that's very prominent in his chart so we can clearly see a, a strong six house influence in his where he gravitates mixing with the mercury venus and mercury conjunct this is also an art, a very artistic conjunction and um he was a let's say musician or artist one of those two um sorry my my details are a little fuzzy but the arts were definitely uh very interesting to to him uh his ascendant lord is saturn it's in the first house showing a lot of dignity and scientific interest because it's in aquarius and saturn and it's retrograde so that also shows that um he's going against the grain going to be thinking outside of the box thinking differently about science about uh his his interests and pursuits and also that he's an authority and a leader in in his scientific pursuits because of saturn excuse me in good dignity here his 10th Lord and third Lord is Mars, and that's ruling the intellect, and that is stationary. You can see the S here. The stationary Mars, it's also out of bounds, but the stationary um, adds a lot of strength. This is a kind of dignity that that's not, it's, it's, I guess you could consider it accidental dignity, though usually they consider accidental dignity the, the position of the house, but it does strengthen the planet a lot, and so I'm not not a lot of sometimes people say it's not strong when a planet's stationary but in my experience it is and there are um i think in vedic astrology they 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 recognize that as well um so i i pick and choose i'm not i'm not um um loyal to one branch i don't i'm not like oh i'm a modern astrologer or i'm a traditional astrologer i'm a vedic i use what works I really don't want to put myself in a box and I, I'm, I mean, it must be the Uranus influence, but I'm just like, no, not doing that. Like, I don't care what you call me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do what works. I'm an astrologer. Uh, you know, God chose me for this, not, you know, some, I have no loyalties. I'm, I'm going to use everything anyway. Little, little tangent there, but yeah. When a planet is stationary, it's definitely uh, has a lot of potency and strength. Even if it, it's not in good dignity, it'll just be, you know, channeled in a different direction. But here the dignity is fine. Um, um, you know, Mars and Sagittarius is okay. And um, it's actually in Saturn's term and the terms or faces so that that's good saturn is uh the sign rules the sign of its exaltation so it does have some dignity for that and it's in the 11th house the 11th house is the house of career success and it's the 10th lord and third lord so the intellect the mind uh and career public recognition is in the house of community hopes wishes dreams career success um the uh, finances or wealth from the career. Um, and so that's very good. Uh, one of the things about Jung that separated him from, from uh, Freud was that Jung had more of an idea about collectivism. And we can see that both with his ascendant in Aquarius and obviously Saturn being the ruler in the first house in Aquarius, but also Mars in the eleventh house, being the um, uh, MC ruler and the third house ruler, and being so prominent, being stationary, um, because Jung thought uh, Freud was very sexually oriented, and he had a Scorpio ascendant, and so um, Scorpio, as we know, has you know strong sexual connotations, um, whereas Jung, being the Aquarian ascendant, Saturn ruled, 
uh, and Mars in the 11th house, Jung was thinking about the collective and he um, stressed the, the collect and he coined the term, uh, the term collective unconscious or collective, collective subconscious, which is one of the things that we use in astrology. A lot of people say the 12th house is the collective uh, subconscious or unconscious. I'm not sure if there is a differentiation there, but on there, on the, the popular terminology, I differentiate it in my own mind uh, between the two, but um, I'm not sure if they do. Anyway, um, Freud was, uh, Jung was big on the, the collective aspect, and that's where they disagreed. They were, um, they were a team, and, and, and uh, Freud really loved Jung. He thought he was great. Um, and he wanted to make him the lifetime president of the, I don't know, some psychology institute that um, Freud um, founded. Uh, but there was heavy objection from other psychologists. So he was the president for two years or the head for two years. Anyway, then there was later there was a falling out because of the differences in their understanding that Freud wanted to kind of um, relate everything back to sexuality and Jung um, uh, didn't. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I could look up the, the exact issue, but I'm not sure I, I, I care enough. Let's just put it down to that. Um, Freud was sexually oriented and Jung was collectively oriented. And it's very obvious in their astrology, um, you know, Aquarius being about the collective, right? And uh, Mars in the 11th house, clearly stationary. So the, the, this collective idea, the group networking, um, Aquarian idealism was, was very much more prominent with Jung. And what's interesting as well is that I would say Jung's, uh, view was more evolved. Um, however, Freud was the initiator. And um, if you just look at their ascendant, um, Freud being Scorpio ascendant ruled by Mars, Mars is, is the initiator. Uh, but Saturn is a, far, a planet that's farther out and considered more mature, right? It's an it's, um, older planet. So uh, those two differences kind of explain a lot about their the, the, the two um, approaches to uh, psychology. Um, Jung chose psychology because it blended science with uh, spirituality. Now he liked spirituality. He liked he was um, more religious than Freud, and you can see that that. Uh, his Jupiter is very prominent in the ninth house cusp, uh, in the ninth house, close to the ninth house uh, cusp, pretty much conjunct within four degrees. And so his relationship with, with uh, philosophy and religion was much more um, intact than uh, Freud's. And he has a nice trine with Saturn here, uh, showing a much more... Um, harmonious relationship with his science. Um, his science and his philosophy and re his religion were, were getting along much more uh, peacefully and easily than with Freud, who had the square. Right. So there was a harmonious um, uh, connection there. And his Jupiter is playing a, a prominent role as well as a more easygoing, peaceful role in the relationship with his psychology. Um, it is opposite Chiron. And so that shows that he's bringing in um, both his own um, issues relating to um, wounds, um, rejection, um, and the like, as well as, um, you know, Chiron's the healer, and he, he, he was a kind of healer. Um, and especially as he matures, I mean, that's going to become more prominent. Chiron's going to take on the more the healing role as it heals itself. Chiron's the wounded healer, but first he has to heal himself. So 
oppositions are a difficult aspect, but they, you know, all opposition, all aspects can be integrated, squares, oppositions, and conjuncts over time. Jupiter is also in conjunct <coughs> um, Pluto here. So that's a difficult aspect to Pluto, but it shows that, um, you know, his philosophy is going to take into account um, psychology and it's going to integrate that. But um, both of these are, are difficult aspects and going to take some time to really um, uh, develop a, as far as his personal philosophy goes. And they're, um, you know, he's got his work cut out for him because of all these hard angles, right? These squares, um, you know, you got Ascendant and Neptune, Neptune, square Sun, T-square with Neptune. So that shows a delusional fantasy quality, you know, until that can be integrated. Uh, and that's also contributing to his, or to, you know, periodic mental, you know, psychotic breaks. Um, and the pro, you know, it's good that his moon is rooted in, in Taurus because if it were in, you know, another more um, difficult sign, like, you know, um, Pisces, Aquarius, Sag, Scorpio, or even possibly Gemini, um, it would be, his mind would be much more unstable and he would probably be in the mental hospital instead of being the one uh, counseling um, others because he's got a lot of difficult aspects to the moon. Um, yeah, Saturn to, to, to Pluto, uh, moon, Uranus, uh, Jupiter, uh, Pluto, Jupiter, Chiron. So, yeah, um, let's see here. Mars, Trine, Chiron. That's a light trine. Um, so South Node is in Libra, and that's in the ninth house as well. Um, so that shows his early interest in religion. He's going to follow in his father's footsteps, but then later um, decided to not do that, but go into psychology. Uh, North Node is in the sign of Mars. So, and in the, well, close to the third house cusp, so third house of intellect. Um, so that's much more in line with what's the direction that he went. Although South Node in the ninth house, you could uh, relate to, um, you know, high level studies as well, obviously. And Venus is in the sixth house of um, health and analytical processes and service to others and things of that nature. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting something about, um, young, but let's keep looking here. Um, what's really interesting, it, if you look at his draconic chart, it's very similar to his natal chart, which is quite fascinating. Um, ascending Capricorn, so Saturn is still the ruler, Saturn is still in Aquarius, uh, North Node is close to Chiron here, so Chiron does really reflect um, a lot of what he he um, went through. Wounded healer, he became a healer, um, a teacher, um, you know. Uh, uh, he did go through uh, periods of mental instability. And we can see a lot of that here as well. Moon is still in Taurus, but now Moon is very close to um, Pluto. And it's reinforcing the, the difficulty he had with his mother, as well as his own mental instability. 
and as, as well as his own interest in psychology, Pluto is the planet that would most um, represent psychology. And then Moon and Neptune. So fantasy, imagination, delusions, uh, things of that nature are also being very prominent here in the third, fourth house. So intellect and um, early childhood and um, as well as his own mental, emotional contentment. Um, these are all tying in together. Um, it's again really interesting that his moon is in Taurus because that helps out so much. I don't think he would have been able to withstand that kind of uh impact from all three outer planets on his moon. Um Mercury and Venus still in Cancer. Um, but in the fifth house, so education. But the fourth house, cost, uh, six, sorry, sixth house cost is still in cancer. So, I mean, still influencing the sixth house. Sun moves into the sixth house um, over the Venus. So a lot of sixth house action here. Um, and then Sun exactly conjunct his draconic Uranus. So really emphasizing the, the brilliance, the originality, the independent mindedness. Um, of young, so yeah, quite quite uh, interesting there. I mean, we have we have to, you know, give give credence to to these kind of thing, this kind of thing, because not everyone has um, made history for you know uh, being a, a psychologist and inventor of psychology. I mean, he's one of the original founders of the, the whole science of psychology. So there is a lot of originality and brilliance that, that goes into that kind of thing. You know, you have to pave the way, you have to be a, a um, way shower. Now also we can see that here, but also because Saturn is retrograde in the first house in its own sign. So that's, um, you know, really showing, um, going against the grain as in the field of, of scientific research. So South Node, Jupiter, um, and South Node conjunct Jupiter, it is the draconic Jupiter, but still even in the natal um, chart, you can still see South Node conjunct Jupiter. Um, is shows a lot of innate internal wisdom that they're pulling, he's pulling from an, an ability to really um, have that uh, Jupiterian philosophy and wisdom um, inherent within his own grasp, so to speak. He's like receiving kind of wisdom almost from the spirit world, you could say channeling, channeling Jupiter. So that's very prominent. Um, as far as also his, his ability to be spiritual as well as scientific. Yeah, so, I mean, Jung um, drew heavily from his own psychological difficulties as well as his mother's uh, mental health issues and brilliant originality, brilliant mind. Uh, both, we can see that, you know, Sun Uranus as well as stationary Mars in the 11th house. Um, in Sagittarius, so philosophical, um, and then Saturn in dignity. He had a lot of dignified planets. Moon, even though exalted, um, was very, very difficult as well um, in the third and fourth house. So very uh, telling, very appropriate for his life story. And I'm sorry, I could not provide more details. Um, you know, this is just the condensed version of his life, um, the super condensed version. So anyway, um, yeah, that's that's it for Carl, Ye Carl Jung. And um, I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to hit the like button, share, subscribe, uh, book a reading with me. 
you can find me at macrogoldmachine at yahoo.com. That's my email. Macroastrology.com is my uh, website. So, all right, guys. Leave a comment if you like, and I will see you again soon. Thanks. Bye.